Hey, Bria. Hi, uh, let me make sure you can share your screen. Um, and then the I'll webinar. Try right now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Me... Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Should probably put something about AAST on here. Uh, so far, we have Alex, um, Rachel, and Samin on, but we're not in the practice room. Um, okay. So I do want you to uh, switch to full screen whenever you are okay. ready, so we can make sure it doesn't need to swap. How's that? Perfect. Okay. So we'll give um, others a couple more minutes to join. We have 12 people registered for the webinar today. Okay. Um, and yeah, we should be all set. Oh, Rachel um, is supposed to introduce me. And oh, she okay. said that she wrote up an intro, but she can't talk. Can you let yeah, her? Yeah, I just, okay. I just promoted her. Yeah. Um, Rachel, I just realized I didn't send you an intro. I am so sorry. No problem at all. I, uh, had your CV from your application. So I just wrote. Oh, one up. perfect. I am so sorry. Hey. Um, I, so I have a question. I sent out the link to like a bunch of people. Are they able to get on if they didn't register? Yeah. Okay, great. And then we also have the link on the homepage too. So. Yeah, and also, can we enable the chat for the um, Zoom so people can write in? Uh, most the Q and A function is where questions go. Um, I can see if I can, but that's normally a setting we do beforehand. So let me see. I just got a request. No problem. Let me just see if we can change that now. Um. Okay, do you want the attendees to just be able to talk to you or everyone? Uh, everyone, I think. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, you're all set. Awesome, thanks, Bria. Okay, excellent. Well, I am I guess we'll get started. Does that sound good or give people a few minutes? Up to you guys, it's 401. Is this... Are, is this the room? Like we're in the room? Yeah, you guys are live. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, I'm happy uh, to start whenever, Rachel. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Rachel Charon. I'm one of the uh, associate member uh, communications committee, um, the vice chair of the AAST, and I am really excited to introduce Dr. Julia Coleman. Um, she is our inaugural speaker for the academic series. Um. Dr. Coleman is currently an assistant professor of surgery at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where she completed her fellowship training. And prior to that, she completed her surgical residency at University of Colorado. During that time, she worked in Dr. Moore's trauma research lab and was funded by an NIH T32 grant. She received her medical school de degree from the University of Toledo School of Medicine and her master's in public health from the Ohio State. She's been recognized with numerous honors and awards. Some of my favorites, were the AAST Best Associate Member poster in 2022, and she was named to the 40 Under 40 Female Surgeons by the AWS. She has nearly 70 peer-reviewed publications and is already an incredibly well-funded and established researcher and has received multiple research grant awards, including the AAST Research and Education Fund Trauma Critical Care Scholarship for 50,000 in 2023. Most notably, she is one of our fearless AAST Associate Member Council leaders and serves on the communications uh, for the Communications Committee. On a personal note, it has been a great pleasure to work with her in our society. And with no further ado, here is Dr. Coleman giving her talk on the interaction of estradiol and platelet biology, a mechanistic exploration of sex dimorphisms in coagulation and implications for transfusion medicine. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chorn, for the introduction. And uh, I also want to convey the mutual respect uh, and how privileged I feel to have been uh, one of the members of the council and serve with you. So thank you for that. And thank you for all of the people that are on tonight. Um, I am gonna be going through some translational science. So that's perhaps my greatest disclaimer, but I'm gonna do my best to keep it interesting and relevant. And I'm gonna start with a picture that many of you have seen, if you've seen me give this talk before, which is that sex dimorphisms exist in nature. And in birds, one can most readily distinguish between males and females phenotypically. Recognizing that these same drastic dimorphisms also exist in humans, the NIH in the last decade has really made a big push for incorporating sex as a biological variable in experimental design. And in fact, uh, moving forward since 2015, any of you may know that have applied for NIH funding that you actually have to describe your accounting of sex as a biological variable in your methodology and experimental structure. So this is something that has been pushed forth by the NIH because we recognize that males and females are not the same. Just as drastically as we see these differences in birds, we see this in humans, and specifically in coagulation, with females demonstrating a relative hypercoagulability as compared to males, with a shorter time to clot formation, a greater rate of clot propagation, increased clot strength, decreased clot breakdown. And this you can really well see in those overlapping tracings, which are from thrombolastography. I'm assuming most of the people on the call are familiar with what that is, but it's a whole blood viscoelastic hemostatic assay that gives you a real-time kinetic description of clot formation. And the things that we pay attention to in those measurements are reaction time, which is time to clot formation, angle, which is the rate of clot propagation and effect of fibrinogen, MA or maximal clot, uh, maximal amplitude, which is the maximal clot strength, mainly in effective platelets, and LY30, which is fibrinolysis 30 minutes after MA, which is an effect of hundreds of fibrinolysis proteins. And so using this instrument, our group first really in a detailed way characterized how clot formation and breakdown is distinct by sex. Um, when you look at just a citrated native tag, so this is a thromboastography with no additives, you see that females form clots faster with a greater rate of clot propagation with increased clot strength. And when you look at functional fibrinogen tag, which is an assay that tells you about fibrinogen's unique contribution to clot strength, so essentially negating out whatever platelets are contributing to clot strength, you see that females have increased functional fibrinogen or increased fibrinogen contribution to clot strength. And when you look at platelet mapping, which looks at platelet reactivity, you see that females have this increased aggregation um, in response to ADP. So why do we care about this? Because it makes a difference clinically. We first published uh, an examination of all trauma activation patients at two level one trauma centers and found that that female specific hypercoagulability we characterize persists after injury. And in the setting of trauma induced coagulopathy, female sex confers a survival benefit. And we are not the first people to describe this. For years now, trauma surgeons and others have described sex dimorphisms in trauma outcomes, uh, particularly as it relates to coagulation and as it relates to inflammation. So these sex-specific differences in coagulation make a difference clinically in terms of outcomes. So the beginning of my translational science journey started really asking mechanistic questions. What could be the mechanism for these population level observations that our group and others that I cited have found? If you look at the overlapping tag tracings, you can see there are many possible candidates. Is this something related to enzymes, the time to clot formation? Is it something to do with fibrinogen? Is it something to do with platelets or the clot strength or clot structure? All of those could be possible mechanistic players. But I think, of course, the most obvious question is, is this all just driven by sex hormones? Or are there actually intrinsic cellular differences, something that's different about the clots between males and females? So to first answer these questions, we started looking at the role of sex hormones in driving sex dimorphisms and coagulation that purport survival benefit. First, we looked at estrogen and hypothesized that estradiol would have a procoagulant effect. 
So we took blood from healthy volunteers and we performed a battery of thromboblastography as well as whole blood thromba generation after spiking blood with physiologic concentrations of estradiol, the same equivalent of what you would see in peak estrus during a menstrual cycle, and found that indeed in vitro estradiol provokes a hypercoagulability. It shortens time to clot formation, it increases clot strength, it decreases clot breakdown, it increases functional fibrinogen, it increases platelet reactivity. So in vitro, estradiol does all of those things. And when you look at whole blood thrombin generation, we see the same, that it causes this increase in peak thrombin as soon as you add it into blood. So we see this in vitro. What about in vivo? This is what we really care about. Sure, you can spike blood with estrogen and create a hypercoagulability, but do we see this in real life? And so then we decided we would look at the hemostatic profile of women throughout their menstrual cycle to see if we could correlate hemostatic changes with estrocycling, hypothesizing that at peak estrus of the menstrual cycle, there would be a hypercoagulable profile. So we performed a prospective cohort study of premenopausal, non-pregnant women with a standard 28-day cycle, not on oral contraceptive pills or any sort of oral uh, hormonal contraceptive, which is actually a very hard population to find. <laughs> and so we drew blood from those women at their peak estradiol and nadir estradiol levels and performed thromboblastography. This was among 25 healthy volunteers and found that as compared to low estrogen, just like we saw in vitro, peak estrogen is associated with significant decrease in time to clot formation and significantly higher clot strength. So we see that both in vitro and in vivo. We presented this actually at AASD at the podium in 2022 and went on to publish this. So indeed, sex hormones are certainly playing a part in sex dimorphisms and coagulation between males and females that purport a survival benefit. But could it be more than just hormones? Could there actually be an intrinsic difference in the cellular biology of males versus females? And the reason we got interested in this is because there's really marked signals with maximum amplitude between males and females, which we know is mainly an effect of platelets. And moreover, we also know that platelets are highly decorated in sex hormone receptors, which I never knew until I started doing this work, that megakaryocytes express androgen, progesterone, estrogen receptors, and platelets specifically are highly decorated in estradiol beta receptors. So we started to ask ourselves, could this lifetime exposure of your bone marrow to estrogen cause a differentiation of your megakaryocyte and platelet lineage so that it's not just the circulating sex hormones that are causing changes, but that the platelets themselves are intrinsically different by sex? We hypothesize that they would be. Now, platelets from females would have increased response to stimuli compared to platelets from males. This has previously been examined in cardiovascular path patients and in the world of antiplatelet therapeutics, but not at baseline and healthy volunteers. So we went to the blood bank and we took platelets that are from the same platelets we're transfusing in our patients in the hospital and looked at the uh, platelet activity in pre and postmenopausal females and age matched males, and specifically looked at platelet aggregation and activation or fibrinogen binding capacity. And we did this after stimulating the platelets with platelet activating factor and ADP. And the reason for that is these two are important agonists, um, releasants after traumatic injury, and both cause a robust increase in fibrinogen binding capacity. So platelet activating factor is released from endothelial cells and platelets. It stimulates a P2Y1 receptor, which works through GQ coupled signaling to increase intracellular calcium, which causes platelet aggregation and activation. ADP is released from platelet-dense granules, and it stimulates both P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptor. Uh, the P2Y12 receptor works for gene inhibitory coupled signaling to release tonic inhibition by cyclic AMP, which also potentiates platelet activation. So after we stimulated platelets with ADP and platelet activating factor, we then measure two things. First is platelet extent shape change, and this is a metric for propensity for aggregation. Normally at rest, platelets have this discoid shape. And then once they're stimulated, they become these tentacled octopus-like cells uh, that become more prone to aggregate. And we also measure platelet activation. Specifically, we looked at alpha 2B beta 3 receptor, which is the fibrinogen receptor by flow cytometry. So we collected apheresis platelets from 53 healthy volunteers, 12 pre and 13 postmenopausal females, and 15 and 13 respectively age-matched males. 
First, we found that when you stimulated platelets with ADP, the female platelets went crazy and the male platelets really didn't change that much in their aggregation behavior. Um, it was the same when we measured them with platelet activating factor, but with ADP stimulation, platelets from females specifically showed aggregation increases. And then when we looked at CD41 cell surface expression or the fibrinogen receptor, we found, again, when you stimulated female platelets with ADP, they had a significant increase in their fibrinogen binding capacity in addition to aggregation, whereas there was no change in males. Interestingly, when we stimulated the platelets with platelet activating factor, we saw the opposite. Whereas in male platelets, they had a significant increase in their fibrinogen binding capacity where there was minimal change seen by females. So after having identified that there were sex-specific aggregation and activation potentials, we then wondered, could we manipulate this with estradiol, given the previous data that I showed you in which we could cause changes in maximum amplitude when we spike blood with estradiol? So indeed, when we incubated platelets and physiologic concentrations of estradiol, the male platelets aggregation behavior after ADP looked the exact same as a female platelet. And when we treated platelets with, platelet with um, estradiol, their platelet activating factor behavior was equivalent. So estradiol made their behavior appear the same for both aggregation and fibrinogen binding capacity. So there's a cellular difference. When you stimulate platelets, Female platelets with ADP, they go crazy. Stimulate male platelets with ADP, they do nothing. Treat the male platelets with estrogen, they act exactly like a female platelet. So there's an intrinsic cellular difference and there's a hormonal effect. We presented this at the Western Trauma Association and then went on to publish it in JTAX in 2019. So once we found that there were these signals related to these two receptors, we wondered, could we then see those changes happening downstream? Presumably, if this is receptor-specific changes, we should be able to see changes in the intracellular signaling pathways. So first, we looked at cyclic AMP and calcium. Now, interestingly, the estradiol receptor that's on platelets that I mentioned it has a same common pathway that converges on calcium and cyclic AMP as the P2Y receptors, and specifically it's CERC kinase. CERC kinase is ubiquitous in many, many cells, and it's an important protein for tyrosine phosphorylation cascades. So we got really interested in now this idea that estradiol may be priming these downstream intracellular signaling cascades. So we first looked at cyclic AMP. There is no difference by sex when you stimulate platelets with ADP. So then we got interested in looking at calcium. We thought this is really the meat of things. There's something different about intracellular calcium levels. Well, intracellular calcium is a little difficult to measure because changes in intracellular calcium within cells happen very quickly. And so actually now I'm doing some work with calcium fluorometrics, looking at fluorescent calcium and changes within platelets. But at this point in time, we didn't have that assay. And so we said, is there another way that we can look at intracellular calcium? Is there some other proxy that we can look at? And that's when we got interested in looking at RNA sequencing. So why look at RNA in platelets? Platelets are anucleate cells. Who cares about any sort of genomic, non-genomic things that are happening in platelets? Well, there's a fair amount of literature that has now described non-genomic effects of estradiol. What does that mean? It means that estrogen, where it normally stimulates the estrogen receptor, which is a steroid receptor, which means it affects the nucleus. So it's a nuclear receptor. It leaves the membrane, it goes to the nucleus, and it changes transcription. Well, estradiol can not only stimulate the receptor, which then goes down and makes nuclear changes, but also estradiol, when it stimulates its receptor, can cause changes in translation, so post-transcriptional changes or non-genomic effects. There's already some literature that shows that estrogen changes translation in platelets in nucleate cells. So we got really interested in that and decided we first wanted to look at the machinery of platelets of translation, the RNA, and see if that is different before then we see if estrogen can modify it. So we first hypothesize that there are sex dimorphisms and platelet RNA profiles that confer differential function and calcium signaling. We took apheresis platelets from healthy volunteers, same platelets from our previous experiments, and we processed them for RNA sequencing, which I could spend a whole nother lecture talking about, 
but we basically shear RNA, we add adapters and barcodes, we filter it by size, amplify it, and then sequence it using a fancy machine. So we took platelets from 27 healthy volunteers, and already we found with that small sample size that there were significant differences in the RNA profiles of males versus females. And interestingly, some of those distinct differences were in RNA sequences related to calcium signaling, specifically BEST1 RNA, which encodes proteins that promote intracellular calcium flux, and that was 1.4-fold higher in females versus males. And also, we saw really interesting signals in TREML1 RNA. And this is an RNA that encodes proteins that propagate platelet activation by enhancing calcium signaling through PI3 kinase. And that was 1.8-fold higher in females versus males. Now, TREML1 is super interesting because it has been actually explored in the world of trauma and murine research. TREML1 is expressed in megakaryocytes. It's packaged in the platelet alpha granules. And when it's released, it causes platelet activation, it binds fibrinogen, it causes cell adhesion and migration. And there's been a lot of great work that's been done by Valance Washington up in Michigan that has shown that TREML1 protects against hemorrhage by facilitating platelet aggregation in murine models. Um, and actually, um, Dr. Washington has now become a collaborator of mine, has been very gracious in uh, sharing TREML1 antibodies in my lab. So we're now exploring more sex dimorphisms in TREML1. So in summary, there are sex dimorphisms that exist in platelets, which are driven mechanistically by P2Y1 and 12 receptor biology, stimulated by ADP, and RNA expression related to calcium signaling all of which we believe can be affected by estradiol through some sort of non-genomic action, whether um, it's through actually affecting the downstream signaling of the P2Y receptors or and or translational modifications in TREML1 and other important RNAs. So indeed, sex hormones are playing a role. Platelets are playing a role. Well, what about clot structure, the end result, really what we care about? Great, estradiol provokes this hypercoagulability and the platelets are different, but does that mean that the end result, the thrombus, the clot that's formed is different? So we first wanted to look at how estradiol is changing the proteome uh, in the circulating blood that a clot is forming in. So first what we did is we took blood and we spiked it with estradiol, whole blood, spiked it with estradiol, and then we extracted the proteins, digested and separated them from mass spectrometry to perform proteomics to see, okay, estradiol is provoking this hypercoagulability, but how is it doing it? What proteins is it affecting? And it, just in a matter of 15-minute incubation in whole blood, estradiol causes hundreds of proteins to be upregulated. And many of those relate to coagulation, to thrombus formation, to platelet behavior. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, fibrinogen, myosin, actin, which we previously presented at EAST in 2019 as having a role in fibrinolysis, complement components, apolipo-A, coagulation factors, many, many platelet glycoproteins expressed on the cell surface. So we see that all these hundreds of proteins are upregulated. Well, does that affect how the clot is cross-linking? So the next thing that we did was worked with a collaborator at University of Colorado um, in their omics core, uh, Dr. Kirk Hansen, who um, actually has developed a novel mass spectrometry technique for detecting cross-linking between fibrin monomers. And so what we did is we spiked blood again with estradiol and then formed clots in vitro and then digested those clots until all that was washed and left behind were the cross-links between the different fibrin monomers. So in that picture on the lower left, you see fib A, B, and G. So those are the three different monomers of fibrin that cross-link together to form a clot. And indeed, when you spike blood with estradiol, you have significant increases in the abundance of cross-links between fibrin chains um, in females. Interestingly, we didn't really see this in males. So there's something specifically that's happening with fibrin cross-linking in females that's really promoted and accentuated with estrogen treatment. So I'm a surgeon, I don't believe anything unless I can see it. So then we decided let's do clot structure work. And so we partnered with some collaborators in Vermont, Dr. Carla Freeman, and uh, looked at uh, fluorescent fibrinogen 
and its response to plasma and under video confocal microscopy. So we took plasma and we formed in vitro plasma clots in the presence of estradiol and fluorescent fibrinogen. And then you look at that under a confocal microsc uh, uh, microscope and you can see the clot forming and breaking down in real time. It's really beautiful. And there's a lot of different metrics that we look at, some of which actually are not really standardized and well established yet. For those of you in the world of coagulation, may be familiar with ISTH, the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis, or our critical care doctors, ISTH is who defines DIC for us and creates definitions and standards, metrics, et cetera. And ISTH just this year um, in Montreal was having an entire session about like what are going to be the established metrics that we talk about fluorescent fibrinogen confocal microscopy. But some of the things that we use in our lab is time to fiber information, time to fibrinolysis, clot resolvability index. Clot resolvability index is essentially a measurement of the clot density. And so when we spiked plasma with estradiol, we found that indeed it causes a more dense clot structure. It increases the fiber resolvability index. And you can see that in that picture on the right compared to the left in these representative images, that it causes this more complex meshed framework, just like we saw this difference in the cross-linking with the fibrin monomers. So hormones are playing a role, sex, um, sex hormones, the, the platelets themselves, the cellular biology, and the clot structure. So, of course, the real question anytime that you're doing translational science is why do we care about this? How does this translate back to the bedside? And so we started to ask ourselves, do these all these results and these sex differences, how do those translate into transfusion medicine? Should we be maybe thinking about sex-specific transfusion practices? Should we be thinking about using estradiol as a therapeutic adjunct? Should we be giving estrogen to coagulopathic patients? Or should we be spiking blood products with estrogen before we transfuse them in patients? So that's what we then shifted to start to explore. And um, it's interesting because there's actually some data um, out of mainly Australia that uh, has looked at uh, sex concordant and discordant donor and recipients in bleeding patients, not necessarily in the setting of trauma, and has found that there are differential outcomes when there are sex concordant or discordant transfusion pairs. So we wanted to really parse this out in vitro. And we hypothesized that if you took blood products from female donors, that they would have increased efficacy in restoring hemostatic capacity in an in vitro model of dilutional coagulopathy. So we took whole blood from healthy volunteers. We created a dilutional coagulopathy model first described by the Pittsburgh lab. And then we transfused that whole blood with various blood products and sex concordant and discordant pairs. So we would take blood from a male, we'd make it dilutional and coagulopathic. We'd add female platelets, male platelets, female cryo, male cryo, et cetera. And found that female platelets had a greater decrease in our time than male platelets and male recipients. Why our time? What's that have to do with platelets? Well, for one, platelets can provide scaffolding for thrombin formation, but also um, platelets are reconstituted um, in, in plasma. So there's platelet-rich plasma, which is what we give um, in platelet transfusion medicine. And female cryo resulted in a greater increase in angle in male recipients. So there was a difference in the um, concordant and discordant transfusion pairs. And this was presented by one of my mentees um, at the podium in 2022 and went on to be published as well. So the clinical implications of all of that is that male and female coagulation is not the same. It's partially mediated by cellular biology, by estrogen, by clot structure formation, and all of this translates back to bedside and that perhaps we need to start thinking about sex-specific selection of blood products. If a patient comes in with trauma-induced coagulopathy, one of which we know is heralded by platelet dysfunction, maybe we need to be selectively transfusing those patients with platelets from females. And is there a role for therapeutic hormones? This has actually already been explored in the world of trauma before. There's actually randomized clinical trials that have looked at progesterone and its ability to mitigate the secondary insult of inflammation after neurotrauma, because we know that sex hormones have an anti-inflammatory effect. 
So this has been explored before. So should we be thinking about giving patients estrogen or spiking or blood products with estrogen to make them essentially super platelets or super power transfusion products? And so I challenge you all, the next time that you're hanging a bag of platelets, you should ask yourself, do these come from a male or female donor? And does that make a difference? Because my work would argue that it does. So where are we going next with all of this? Now I'm actually in the, the throes of writing my, my KOA grant, my career development grant, which is really taking some of this mechanistic work to the next level and really looking more closely at CERC kinase. And again, CERC kinase is the shared common pathway between pure nergenic receptors on platelets at P2Y1 and 12 receptor that are stimulated by ADP and the estradiol beta receptor. Those converge on CERC kinase. And so the question that I have is, are the platelets that we're transfusing in our patients different by sex because of something with the P2Y1 and 12 receptors and or a difference in the estradiol, whether that's affected the platelet lineage or is circulating within the platelets? So that is sort of the next step that we're looking at. Um, and looking at all of these changes that I described to you are in fresh platelets. So these are fresh platelets. You've taken them from the donor. And as soon as they donate, I'm taking some of those platelets and I'm running them down a lab. But the question is, do we see those enduring over the shelf life of a platelet? Most hospitals will have platelets on shakers for five days in their hospital. Well, does the efficacy of female platelet transfusion or whatever these sex differences are, persist over the shelf life of a platelet. Those things have yet to be determined in as much as we really don't know the dose response of estrogen, both the endogenous estrogen of the donor and any exogenous estrogen we were to add. And so one of the things that really excites me about this work is that um, it goes to show that when you consider sex as a biological variable in experimental design, um, it can completely drastically change the results of your study and how you think about your study. So I challenge people that are on this call, no matter what type of research that you do, let's say that you do translational research with animals and you do mere large or small animal models, are you looking at both males and females? If not, maybe you should. If you're looking at female animals, are you looking at where they are in their menstrual cycle? If you're looking at coagulation, that may make a difference. Or let's say that you're doing translational work, but you do cell culture or you work with Huvex. Do you know if those are from males or females? Because if so, it may change your results completely. Let's say you don't do translational research and you're like, the last half hour has been boring. I don't do that kind of stuff. It still matters. Let's say you're doing clinical trials or you're doing a retrospective chart review. I can't count how many times I read a paper and it says we controlled for sex. Maybe you shouldn't be controlling for it. You should be stratifying by it and looking and seeing how your results may be different and the way you interpret them when you consider sex as a biological variable in your experimental design. So my hope is that this will be really, that's my take home challenge to people that are doing research. I just read a, a paper actually today um, by Lena Napolitano who's a senior author on it that was looking at um, sex differences in trauma care and was looking at the rates at which BT chemoprophylaxis was given or TXA was given or massive transfusion was done for patients who are the same except for their sex. And women, female trauma patients, whether by sex or, or gender, female trauma patients were less likely to get VTE chemoprophylaxis, were less likely to get massive transfusion, were less likely to get TXA. So there's even an unconscious bias, not just us as scientists and our experimental design, but even in the way that we are treating patients. So sex as a biological variable is important in science and in our clinical care. And so my covert mission in doing this work, besides it interesting me, is trying to really go on a crusade of justice for females being incorporated in clinical trials and consideration of scientific design and clinical care. So I want to thank um, all of my mentors, of which there are many, here is the majority of people that are on my rack for my KOA grant, Rich Gamina, who is an interventional cardiologist here at Ohio State, Thomas Hunt, who is 
the director of research at Ohio State and uh, biochemist and background, Bryce Curlin, who's a hematologist at Nationwide, uh, Mitch Cohen, who's a trauma surgeon at University of Colorado in Denver and has been a great mentor to me, as has been Mackie Neal, a trauma surgeon at Pittsburgh, Christy Townsend, who is a neurosurgeon, PhD, uh, neurosurgery PhD here at Ohio State that studies sex dimorphisms, um, and one of my um, career advisors and mentors here, Carrie Sims, um, who is an MD PhD, has done the K, has written the R's, um, and has been very supportive of me at Ohio State. So I want to acknowledge them, and of course the AAST, uh, because their research scholarship is funding what I am doing now in uh, developing supportive data for my KOA grant. So. I will pause to take some questions, but before I do, I wanna put a plug in for the AAST Academic Series. So if you are interested in sharing some of your science, this is a great opportunity for you. Let's say you're writing a grant and you wanna present your data and see what people think. This is a great way to do it with your peers. If you are trying to build your CV for promotion and tenure, here you are, you have presented at an academic series for the national AAST. So no matter what it is, or if you just wanna share your science, you wanna work on a talk, this is a great opportunity to do that. If you go onto our website, um, onto AAST.org, and you, even if you just Google associate member academic series, um, whichever is the upcoming series will be at the top of the page and you scroll down and here you can input um, your uh, credentials and your CV so you can be put into a pool of speakers to be selected for academic series. So I encourage you all to apply for that. And I wanted to go 30 minutes. I'm a little over that, but I'm going to stop now and, and pause for questions. Feel free um, to either put them in the chat or the Q&A, or I think you can maybe unmute yourself and ask questions as well. Um, any questions? And also, if anyone's interested in collaborating, I have my contact info up here. If you want to collaborate on a multi-center trial, a multi-center study, looking at a retrospective chart review, whatever it is, please, please, please um, reach out to me. I'm always looking for collaboration. And Bria is saying, please raise your hand if you would like to be unmuted. Well, I'm not sure what the collective GCS is here. Hopefully, <laughs> I still got you guys with me. Fantastic talk. This was incredibly just really fun to hear. I think one of the best things about the associate membership is the relationships we all get to build with one another. But then this is really fun because even though we work together so frequently and you're so passionate about the subject, I never actually get to hear about this in particular. So I think it's really fun getting to know what we're all um, working on behind the scenes of um, double IST during our day jobs. So I guess a few questions. The first one is um, for young faculty and trainees who want to start up this kind of research, what kind of resources do you have? And, you know, when you're talking about your um, donor specimen collection and then bringing it to the lab, you know, what is that process like and how, what was, you know, how, what was your experience in getting that up and running um, as a trainee and then now as a faculty member? Yeah, so um, the beginning of this research started, and I can also in tandem kind of interest uh, um, answer Samin's question, which was how did I first become interested in this? So um, I knew that I wanted to do research uh, and probably translational research when I started residency. And so um, I had reached out during my second year of residency, knowing at the end of that year, I'd be stepping out to the lab, started meeting with various trauma surgeons, asking what sort of things they were working on and saw what piqued my interest. And I met with um, Dr. Jean Moore, who at that time was sort of solely running uh, the trauma coagulation core. And then Mitch Cohen joined a year later when he came from UCSF, um, but met with him and he was talking about the work that he did in trauma-induced coagulopathy. And I was interested in that. And so applied for a seat in his lab and was lucky enough to get one of the T32 spots. And so I think when you're a resident in particular, certainly you can try to build something on your own, but that is a prodigious task. And so I think the key when you are a resident is, is really to um, find someone that is doing something you're interested in and seeing how you can piggyback onto that. Um, and then eventually you might find something within that work that really calls to you. And that's what happened to me. So I started in that lab and um, I said, you know, give me a project. I just want to start working on something. And they had just um, gotten a big data set of metabolomics, a metabolomic data set 
of trauma patients and had found, uh, we're looking at what were metabolites that were associated in predicted survival in trauma patients. And one of them was pregnadiol, uh, which is a metabolite of progesterone. And I was like, that's interesting. I wonder, you know, why would pregnadiol increase survival or purport a survival benefit? And so I wondered, you know, what's the difference between male and female survival with similar degrees of injury? So then I did this retrospective chart review and found that female sex convert a survival benefit in the setting of trauma-induced coagulopathy. And that got me then on really looking at what are the female and male differences in coagulation and how does that matter in trauma? And next thing you know, like here I am. So that's how I started was based on a population level observation and going down a rabbit hole of, of mechanistic questions. And so that's how I then got started in the lab. And then um, when I was through, I continued that beyond the lab and residency and I loved it. So I knew that that was something that I wanted to do when I was a faculty. And that was a big thing for me when I was interviewing for jobs was that it made it clear to people that my goal was to be a translational surgeon scientist. And I wanted to be somewhere where I had a lab, meaning I was given lab space, I had startup funds and I had protected time. And believe it or not, that was really the, a big conversation point at a lot of my job negotiations was being able to get those resources. And fortunately, I got a very generous package here at Ohio State to do that, um, which has been exciting, um, but also a real challenge. So, you know, I think there are pros and cons when you're looking for jobs of finding a place where people are doing what you're doing. Um, and if they are, it's great. You plug yourself into the machinery of that and you can hit the ground running. Um, but it's also exciting to go somewhere where no one is doing exactly what you're doing. So that mentor panel that I showed you, I mean, it's like a cardiologist, a hematologist, a neuroscience person. There was no one exactly doing what I was doing, which was, I found really, really exciting that I could build that here. It's also been challenging. You know, they give me a lab space. I walk in, it's empty. There's no gloves. There's no pipettes. There's no benches. There's nothing. And so I've had to start to, in the last six months, build that from the ground up. Actually get the equipment, get the lab, get the lab personnel, um, go through all of the paperwork and things that are required. And so it's really just in the last month or so that I've started to actually be generating my own data, doing flow cytometry, doing aggregometry and platelets. So it is, um, if you're doing translational science, you just have to buckle in for a totally different timeline. You know, surgeons want to like get things done and it's just a different timeline. And so once you become an attending, I think you have to shift a lot of your expectations um, and pace to be uh, more long-term. It's about investment and intellectual wealth more than, than intellectual finance. So um, that was a big thing. Um, resources. There are awesome scholarships. If you are a resident, you name it with societies, American College of Surgeons, EAST, AAST, AAS, ASC, they all have scholarships for residents and also have great mentorship programs. Like I did the EAST mentorship program. My mentor, Meyer Patel, helped me in generating my K-08 and helped me with my job negotiations around the lab. Um, so those are great resources. And then too, if you're a junior attending, the same thing goes. I got a societal grant as a junior attending. Um, there's also some great stuff from the American College of Surgeons. The Klaus Award is excellent. And then of course, NIH has um, great career development grants, but also there's like the DOD or uh, B BDRAG. All of those are other big groups that have um, junior attending funding. So um, Internal K grants is another thing at your own hospital. So those are all options. Those are all resources. I think I hit all three of those questions. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. One of my partners does um, basic science research and just started, she's uh, just starting her second year. And so a lot of, she would have a lot of those shared experiences. Dr. Goswami, she's also one of the associate members. Um, I think Dr. Mizoso has a question, so we can unmute him. Dr. Coleman, can you hear me? Yep. So first of all, I want to say for all of the residents and the fellows that are logged into the call, I mean, when you talk about somebody who's an expert at what they're talking about, I think Dr. Coleman just exemplified that pretty well. Um, that talk was just, I mean, masterful, the, the you know, vast fund of knowledge that you have about this and how easy it is for you to talk about it. Um, so thank you for that, because I thought that was a really, really incredible talk. Um, my question, I guess, is to take one of the things that you mentioned a little bit further, I think, especially for 
you know, junior people trying to start out and figuring out how to do all this, because at the end of the day, um, you're, you're also being paid to be a trauma surgeon and to take call and to have clinical responsibility. And so how do you balance that? What are your thoughts on partnering with, um, you know, a, a strong PhD that actually, you know, runs the day to day of your lab? I mean, are, are you, are you pipetting and flow cytometrying the whole week or do you have somebody else doing that? How does all that work? And what advice would you give to, you know, a, Jew, a fellow coming out who's looking to, to establish themselves in, in their area? Yeah, they, well, first of all, Dr. Mazzoso, thank you. High, high praise coming from you, so thank you. Um, the That is a great question. So I think what it means to be a, a surgeon scientist, translational science or not, um, has changed a lot in the last couple of decades. Um, and this whole idea of like the quadruple threat, I, I'm not sure that that really exists like in a really rich, meaningful way. I think you can be everything, but not all at the same time. Um, and so the way to be a successful surgeon scientist, as I perceive it, not that necessarily as I experience it, but as I perceive it, it is a team sport. Um, certainly. And so, you know, right now, for example, I have um, a certain aliquot of protected time of my FTE. Um, and so during that time, I'm able to actually go to the lab uh, to actually do experiments. But otherwise, if it was dependent on me doing all of the experiments, it would be hard to get things done and to maintain momentum. And so the key is finding a team that you can be a part of and, and lab techs that you can work with, either postdocs, lab techs, as, as Dr. Mazzoso mentioned, PhDs that you can work with that can help you to do these things. So um, right now I'm training a tech on uh, my aggregometer. And so i and meeting with her this week on my week on research to train her on stuff so that, you know, in two weeks when I'm on trauma for the week that hopefully she can still be doing aggregometry. And, um, you know, if there's a week that I'm off service and that I'm going to need someone else to do flow cytometry, a plate, extra platelets show up from the blood bank. So it's definitely a team sport. And so um, finding um, a mentor that you can work with uh, wherever you're going to get hired is huge. Um, and for me, that was finding like a senior investigator that had a well-established lab that was geographically close to mine where we could share personnel, we could share resources. Um, a lot of, of uh, hospitals are now moving towards uh, sort of co-ops, if you will, um, where it doesn't make sense for everyone to buy a flow cytometer or everyone to buy a tag machine if we can have shared equipment policies. So that makes a lot more sense from a workflow standpoint and from just financial standpoint as well. So it is possible to do it, you, but you have to do it as a team. So on my research weeks off, Am I sitting down and doing grant writing and manuscript writing and thinking like honestly, a lot of science is having the time and protection and space to think. Um, and so I'm doing that on my weeks off. I'm also doing bench work on my weeks off. Um, but when I'm not and I'm on service, someone else is because it has to be a team sport. And so that's a big part is recruiting and finding your team to be able to pull those things off. Thank you so much. I'd say my one question looking into the future, kind of when you were talking about, uh, you know, platelets and who the donor is, is it male, female, doesn't matter. What do you think about uh, when we have um, uh, patients in the trauma bay and maybe uh, we don't have resources like TEG and Rotem? Do you see a future where we'll be resuscitating patients differently based on sex? I hope so. I'm so glad you asked that. So my dream, the thing that like really gets me excited that I think about is, you know, what I would love is one day, years from now, when I'm senile and gray, which doesn't feel far away, <laughs> that I would love that all platelets that were transfusing in patients to increase the efficacy of that platelet transfusion were spiking it with estrogen before we transfuse the patient. Or in someone that has refractory coagulopathy as a Hail Mary, like we do for you know, methylene blue and refractory shock or TXA and profound hyperfibrinolysis that we would actually give that patient estrogen. Um, that has been described in the literature, uh, mainly in cardiopulmonary bypass patients and in liver transplant, it has been explored as being used intraoperatively. It decreases um, intraoperative blood loss. 
and in other um, avenues. And so that would be my dream is that we would think about that. Um, I think, you know, the next obvious question with some of my work is all of the stuff that I'm doing is with donors, but I haven't studied it in recipients, which is really what I want to try to do in, in my future R grant, which is, okay, great. You created a super platelet by spiking it with estrogen. Well, does that actually matter when you give it to a trauma patient? Because um, there's some data that's been, you know, put forth by um, Lucy Kornbluth, who's an amazing scientist um, out at UCSF, where she has shown that even if you have, you know, you give platelets to trauma patients because of the plasma milieu being so deranged, it may not matter um, in early platelet transfusion. So that'll be, you know, a next obvious step. But yeah, my dream of dreams is we'll create super platelets all the time by spiking them with estrogen and maybe even give estrogen or profoundly hypocoagulable patients. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, I find this super fascinating, really inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for having me and have a great night.